All right, you ready? I'm ready to roll. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. As a reminder, Bunker Lab will host an in-person event on July 8th at 6 p.m. at the Tribal One Third Avenue Reward. We're going to have 10 great military veterans do two-minute pitches of their companies, and we're going to have an entrepreneurial panel on the future of entre entrepreneurship in Seattle. Also, my company, Kevin's HR, is releasing our MVP in July, and we're, and we're taking on, and we want to, and we need people to join our waitlist to do the beta testing. Our guest today is Mr. Scott Schliebner. Scott, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready. Scott is a clinical development executive with 25 plus, with a 25 year plus background in clinical research, clinical operations, and drug development. Scott has served in a variety of leadership roles across the biotech, nonprofit, in CRO sectors, developing innovative solutions to help overcome the challenges inherent to conducting research and challenging patient populations. S Scott, I mean, you're a busy person, you have a lot going on. What, what do you focus on right now? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, happy to be with you today. Um, yeah, I focus really on the design and conduct of clinical trials. And so for those of you out there who don't necessarily work in that space or interact with clinical trials, or if you're like my mother and you really have no idea what I do day to day, the pandemic and COVID gave us a little bit of an insight into, you know, vaccine clinical trials. And we started paying attention to things like Pfizer's data and efficacy of the vaccine. That's what I do. Not necessarily vaccines. I focus on rare diseases and, and, and um, some patient populations with unmet medical need. And I'm essentially really passionate about making sure that clinical trials uh, think about the patients themselves first and that they're designed to be easy enough for patients and families to participate in. Historically, clinical trials, you know, we, we rely on patients to enroll and we gather data and make sure new therapies are safe and they're effective, but we never think about the patients who actually have to enroll and participate and dedicate their time to it. So it's an odd situation where this whole industry has been based on relying on patients as the ultimate stakeholder, but sort of leaving them off to the side. And I just think that's wrong and I'm committed to making that better. So Scott, you know, of course, everything on TV is not true. But on TV, you see, you know, people who like need money, they do a clinical trial, they pay hundred dollars a week and they get come back with like all kinds of side effects. I'm pretty sure this is far from the truth of how clinical trials actually work, right? You know, clinical trials are really misunderstood and everyone thinks, oh, you're going to be a guinea pig and all of this stuff. There are, um, there are studies out there like that you're talking about where there's a new medicine and the first study needs to be done in what they would call like healthy, normal volunteers. Just maybe college students get recruited. They make sure the drug is safe. They make sure there's no terrible side effects. Of course, there's a lot of work done before it even goes into a human and the FDA and other regulatory agencies are super involved with making sure that even that first step is very, very safe and we've studied it as much as we can. But there are, there are some scenarios like that of let's study a new drug and let's see if it is just safe and somebody can tolerate it. And then maybe we'll move into disease states. But the far majority, you know, 95% of clinical trials are developing new therapies because typically the standard of care, the stuff that's approved out there already, it sucks, right? If it's, if it's like, you, you know, you have a family member with um, a certain type of cancer, the standard of care for cancer generally isn't very good, right? And so um, you can just get a prescription or work with your oncologist on a new, on whatever therapies out there, but the best, the cutting edge stuff, the best precision medicine, the best latest advances are in clinical trials. And so historically that's been a little bit removed from normal healthcare but we're trying to work to bring clinical trials and healthcare kind of together so that you can go to your doctor and have a watch and wait, watch and wait uh, sort of method or take the standard of care that's there or enroll in a clinical trial of a new cutting edge therapy that might be really the thing you need to kind of put your disease at, at bay. Scott, is it like one international standard everyone follows? Does each country have their own like process for doing this? There's a lot of regulations that slow things down Essentially, you know, the EU operates as one sort of unified um, group. UK now, of course, with Brexit is doing their own thing. The US has their own. Each country really requires you to like file a little bit of paperwork, 
on the data and the safety that you have of the drug and what your plan is to do that. So if you want to conduct a clinical trial in a dozen countries around the world, you do need to kind of file something in each country and let their um, regulatory bodies review it, make sure they're acceptable. And then of course, beyond that, there's also what we call um, institutional review boards, IRBs, or in Europe and elsewhere, we call them ethics committees, ECs. And those are also another layer of making sure um, this study that we're gonna do in patients or healthy normals, let's make sure we're not, let's make sure it's safe. Let's make sure we're not taking advantage of anyone. Let's make sure that it's fair. Let's, you know, so there's there's a lot of levels of review to make sure that things are are being done appropriately and such. And I'm guessing this is usually done by what I guess what's called big big pharma is usually does these these trials. It's really anybody. So again, this space is sort of hidden, and a lot of people didn't even really know about the clinical trial space. But it's a huge industry that's driving these new medicines. There is the big pharma folks, the Pfizer's and J and J's of the world. We've heard. But then there are hundreds, thousands of smaller biotech um, emerging pharma companies, you know, right here in downtown Seattle, there's a couple smaller organizations that people have never heard of. They have a new medicine and new science and they wanna develop it. And to do that, you have to conduct clinical trials. And so um, everyone from a startup mom and pop shop to a virtual company with 10 employees to the Pfizer's of the world are all kind of doing this. So, so it's, it's, it's probably not easy, but it's not impossible for a startup to get breaking the space in. Not at all. I think in that, that sort of small startup biotech space is, it's kind of high risk, high reward. I mean, you know, these, the drugs, you know, there's a lot of work that's done, like I said, before you even get into patients or human studies, there's a ton of work that's done um, in vitro and then in vivo and animal studies and things to make sure that things are safe and okay. And that takes a few years, that could take some money, and then you kind of move into clinical trials. So, you know, there are some barriers to entry, but it is possible for really anybody to do it. So Scott, what responsibilities does a, do the patients have in clinical research? I mean, what was what their role in this? Well, when we have a new potential investigational therapy that we want to, develop and make sure it's safe and, and uh, efficacious and approved and out there in the world, we have to collect data. We have to collect data on patients taking that drug and make sure that there's no additional side effects from what they already are suffering from. We wanna measure the effectiveness of that drug. Patient's responsibility, well, it's interesting you ask that. I mean, we again, we, we are dependent 100% on patients enrolling in studies to be able to collect data and move these medicines along. So the responsibility really is to just be open and talk with their provider or physician and learn a little bit and really just enroll. The, res the responsibility component these days for me really sits with the pharma biotech companies. The responsibility of you wanna develop these new drugs, but a lot of times these clinical trials are made up of this huge, like, you know, Excel spreadsheet of all these different visits and assessments and tests and poking and prodding and things that patients have to do. A lot of times it requires traveling really long distances. So for me, the responsibility for, for patients, again, is just show up and participate. But the burden really should be on industry to say, make this easier for these patients. We're relying on patients who already have some type of disease or condition, um, let's make it reasonable for them to participate in this clinical trial. Yeah, so know? just to break down the customer service, like you have a good, give them a great user experience, already have a disease, they're already suffering probably, like make it as easy as possible. Right, I mean, like, so sitting here with an iPhone, right? It's got a camera on it. Apple didn't say, let's put a camera on a phone. Let's see if people like it. We don't know if even anyone wants it or they'll use it. No, like this is completely driven by customers, right? It's driven by consumers and what they want and it's driven by what what consumers can use right and so that mindset has not historically existed in this kind of archaic clinical trial space um the end users the ultimate stakeholders the patients have typically been left out of the process so we design these studies we put these clinical trials out there um ironically more than half of all of them are behind schedule of enrollments. 
because patients are hesitant to enroll because they're signing up for a year long clinical trial that like requires them to miss work and get childcare and they have to drive long distances to get to hospitals. Um, so we need to borrow actually some concepts from other industries like tech and otherwise, where you just think about customers first, you think about your consumers and they kind of drive a little bit what you do. So if that makes sense, you know, we need to incorporate a little bit of that patient perspective, patient feedback into the process so that we're, um, we're partnering with our partners. How is someone selected being a clinical research? Like y'all said, like, does it like Mark, big pharma market send out mass email to like people and try to like, like hit and spray or like, it, or you get like patient lists from hospitals. How does that actually work? Yeah. So there's a, there's a really broad spectrum. So going back to the uh, healthy, normal volunteers who would volunteer to get paid a hundred dollars to participate, there's that end of the spectrum, which is essentially, yeah, there might be research clinics near college campuses and they put flyers on campus and say, can you take four hours to participate in a study? We'll pay you a hundred hours, blah, blah, blah. There's that. The other end of the spectrum is, you know, patients with, um, you know, like take it like, again, I'll use the example of like a family member with um, breast cancer, let's say. Um, they're going to their treating oncologist who treats their cancer and they're talking about what to do next and evaluating available standard of care and doing scans every eight weeks to watch their disease. And then those physicians are usually the ones who will say, hey, Jason, you know, um, what we're doing is not really working so great. We can continue on that, but there are two other clinical trials that could work really well for your type of tumor. And I think if you're open to it, we should give one of them a try. Let me share some information and tell you about the trial. And there's a long consent form that like allows you to educate and ask some questions. So there's recruitment over here. And then there's actual like conversations happening and, and clinical trials are sort of starting to fit into a typical like clinical, a typical healthcare setting. If that makes sense. Yes. So Scott, um, for the COVID vaccine, you know, some people are like you know, 100% for, some people like 100% against it. But I think a question some people had was like, how did the COVID vaccine get developed so fast, right? It only took a year. Can you yeah. talk about that process? Why were it sped up for it? Why, even though it's sped up for you, is it actually a safe vaccine and, and all the background to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, the vaccine's pretty fascinating and I am not like a vaccine expert per se, but my company actually did run um, some of the large clinical trials for the vaccines. And I have some colleagues who just spend their days thinking about vaccines. It's a little bit off to the side of my focus, but um, what has been amazing is that like once the pandemic hit, um, and kind of the world shut down a little bit, um, my industry like geared up behind the scenes to really accelerate things. So, you know, you have a, you have a, a Pfizer or a J and J or an AstraZeneca or, or someone who's kind of, you know, developed this vaccine and done some basic testing, and then they need global organizations to be able to, um, coordinate clinical trials of these vaccines. So, um, you know, vaccines could be administered by your doctor or a healthcare worker or a nurse somewhere. Um, the way we saw with, with our vaccines getting, getting put out into the world, um, these take place in lots of different states and countries and someone coordinates all of that. Um, the background work of the vaccines themselves. So there's a lot of, some of these platforms that they're built on um, have been well-designed ahead of time. And in a way, like this is kind of making it overly simplistic, but if you could envision like, you know, the platform is 90% built and then we learn a little bit about COVID and we put the COVID specific receptor things on top of the platform and just customize the last little bit of it to fit that particular virus. Hopefully we can do that in the future when we have another outbreak of sorts where we can take a platform and do all the work right now and get it kind of 90% ready. And then when we have a particular virus out there, um, we just kind of make tweaks and we can build the last little customized part on top of it. So that was one part, the technical part of the vaccine. Some of that was um, sort of pre-developed and kind of ready. But then um, the amazing part is somebody who's been in clinical research and clinical development for so long, I feel like our industry is a bit archaic in a lot of ways. And it takes forever. You asked about regulatory, you know, countries and filing paperwork. 
there is a lot of bureaucracy, right? And patients can't wait and it takes too long to like get medicines to people. But in COVID, everything was just, we just dropped everything and we cut through the red tape and we were able to open studies fast and people were super motivated to get the vaccine in a clinical trial, right? Because they didn't want to get COVID. Um, if we had similar motivation for clinical trials, like if we had patients really clamoring to like participate in the development of a new cancer drug, um, and we had institutions really willing to like cut through the red tape and make it efficient, we could accelerate everything like exponentially. So, you know, I've got some colleagues who are like, we did it for COVID, why can't we do it for everything else? And I think it's a great point. Yeah, I think it's a good question to have. So did only American companies come with a vaccine or do other countries' companies come with the vaccines also? Yeah, no, there were others, okay. um, you know, and, and almost everybody partnered, right? You've got, um, you had AstraZeneca in the mix, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, BioNTech, um, UK groups. Um, and there are hundreds of other vaccines literally in development today that are not as far along or, uh, you know, Moderna is a US based company as well. Um, there are a lot of them out there and they've spanned the whole world. And some of them um, didn't do so well and their data didn't really work very well. Um, some of them ran out of money and had to stop developing. Some of them were too late or they moved too slow, but it hasn't been a US thing. I think we've gotten a little more publicity here. And I think our government went out and essentially purchased a lot of vaccines for our people. But the development really cuts across all the countries and, and companies. So with COVID, I mean, and you might, you might know the answer this. Do you see COVID like being with us forever and like more like variants coming out every year, a new vaccine coming every year where we have to do some kind of booster vaccine once you're sort of like just like the flu shot, sort of, so to speak? Yeah, you know, and I mean, I'm not an infectious disease expert by any stretch, um, but um you know, I just try to, I try to listen to the, the people out there that are smarter than me. And I try to listen to the, I mean, if you, if you pay attention to like the Bill Gates podcasts or writings, like several years ago, where he's like, we're not ready. We need to be ready. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the, um, the surveillance systems. We don't have the vaccine delivery programs. And it's such a challenging thing because there's so many things that you could be spending money on as a government, right? We have in Seattle, we have bridges collapsing, right? And we've got infrastructure failing. And so we deal with the stuff in front of us that's an emergency, but we're not really good at saying, let's invest millions of dollars into something that's not a threat today, but it's kind of like coming in three years. We're pretty bad at that. We're more reactionary and not so proactive. So do I think, yeah, I think we're gonna see much more of this. I think as, I mean, I think you've got a couple things going on. As you, as you see urban centers expanding, right? And starting to encroach upon more um, natural areas, wildlife, et cetera, you start any, you have, you have animals and humans coming together more, right? These viruses take a leap that way. Um, we're such a global world, right? That, you know, somebody gets something in China and like two weeks later, it's at a nursing home in Kirkland, right? And then a pandemic starts across the world. So there's transmission, there's um, us interacting a lot more. Um, I'm no expert in this area, but I think we'll absolutely see something. It'll be some other variant. Hopefully it's not as bad. Hopefully it's not as widespread, but hopefully we take these learnings we've had over the last 15 months and don't forget about it and just say, oh, we're, our numbers are down, great. Let's shelve all those plans. We should be investing right now for the next one, right? We need to be ready. Yeah, in the army, we had we had a saying talking about no focus on now and 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 now with the future. We had a saying in the army, I can't worry about next month when I'm on a six inch knife fight right now. Yep. You know, right? I mean, the bridge is falling down right now. Do you really have time to do the pandemic, pandemic stuff, right? Right. And with the pandemic, like it was bad and all, but I, I think we. I mean, this that's my first. I think we got kind of lucky, right? Because the numbers could be way way worse, right? I think the Spanish flu numbers were influenced was worse. I mean, just based on stats, I know people died. It was, it was bad and wrong, but I think it could have been a lot worse, right? And I think maybe there yeah. might be a prep test for us for when the next pandemic comes. So, you know, lessons learned, hopefully, you know. Well, we're in Seattle, and I know, I don't know where your um, listeners are, but, um, you know, we've had our own unique take on it here, right? We're very compliant. We're very rule followers. 
I actually wore a mask down the street to get a Starbucks here on the way in. It's like the only one with a mask on. I've been vaccinated for months, but we're still like, I think we have the highest vaccination rate. We're yeah. Very rule following. Um, it started here essentially in the U S um, but the rest of the world or the rest of the country even is, you know, struggling. Some of the Delta variant stuff that's popping up where people are not getting vaccinated, you know, vaccinate vaccine hesitancy is another huge topic to touch on if you want. Um, but um, I think we did do pretty well here because we were pretty aggressive about like locking down and being conservative and it wasn't fun. You know, it wasn't fun being super locked down in February when it was raining and dark. And then I talked to my colleagues and they're like, we're going to Vegas and we're going to wherever. And you're like, wow, we don't even, we can't even go to a restaurant, but we did some things that were probably pretty smart that way that kind of helped us kind of get through it. Yeah, I read an article in a paper the other day where it said Seattle's the first, like first major city to hit 70% vaccine mm -hmm. rate. And the reason is why, and, and some of the, they, the person did the article to talk to us like you do, like complying, you know, like how we are, you know, you hit 70% yeah. first. It's amazing. So um, what role does the CDC and FDA play in all this? So Centers for Disease Control and Prevention based in Atlanta and FDA based in, you know, Rockville, D.C. area. So, you know, FDA um, allows sort of serves as the regulatory body to um, um, allow studies to go forward and um, approving the, the uh, you know, the, the approval of new medicines. Right. So they're the regulators who give the yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down. The CDC is a little different and that they are not really the regulatory body. Um, you know, there's a lot of research going on there. There's a lot of guidelines being um, established. They're the ones telling us, you know, um, it doesn't look like the vaccine's transmitted by air. You don't have to wear a mask or you do have to wear a mask or we should do this or we should wash our hands. They're sort of watching what happens and guiding the public a little bit. Um, they're not necessarily putting out like mandates or rules, whereas the FDA is a governing regulatory body that really has the ultimate say on, you know, can your vaccine trial open? Yes or no? Is your vaccine going to get approved? So when, when we started seeing some of the, um, the first vaccines um, um, have like emergency or conditional authorization, meaning like not full approval, but the data looks good. Let's hurry up and get this into people. You know, you'd see like the CDC would have their own advisory committees and they would vote and they would say, this looks great. And that's not the final word. It really needs to be from the FDA itself. So two different bodies, um, two amazing institutions. And, um, you know, even if you're not a scientist, I mean, please listen to the science, and listen to those people. So, and this is my perception. It's like sometimes it like, all the different organizations and the different scientists from different, like John Hopkins Hospital, different, it's not like they would like say different things sometimes, right? Like one person say one thing on Monday, so I would contradict, is this just the way the science works? You know, everyone's like fleshing out ideas because it seemed like they would like, you know, contradict themselves and, and the public get confused. Like, wow, wow, he said this, she said this, who would I believe, right? Yeah, I mean, I struggle with that too, right? You, I mean, and you could critique some of these groups where they, you know, initially it was don't wear masks, save masks for our healthcare workers, doesn't help. And then it became a 180, right? Put your mask on, don't take your mask off. We need them badly. Um, I don't know, it's complicated. I think that part of it is that information and data and news and opinions gets so quickly transmitted everywhere these days, right? Like, you know, someone gets quoted and it's spread everywhere really quick. Um, Maybe it was too early to make that statement, you know? Maybe that statement needs to be couched. Sometimes I feel like people come out and say things and, you know, it's really, you know, whether it's like clickbait or you want some type of attention, sometimes we grab like a sentence or two from something and put it out there and it gets people's attention. But you're like, well, go back to the full article because like you missed the whole context. Yeah. Like you kind of extracted something that doesn't really, doesn't really say the full truth. So I feel like that's a challenge. Um, science though is ever evolving. It's not like it's an absolute thing. You kind of keep building on the work of one another 
and advancing it always. It's never a static thing. So um, I'd love to see us be careful about what we put out because people just hear sound clips and go with it. Coffee causes cancer. Coffee's good for you. You could probably Google it right now and find same, same, same thing. With, same thing with eggs, right? Doesn't same thing right? with eggs good, causes cholesterol. No bad, you know. So I think that there's a lot of information out there, and um, there's a there's. A, I don't think we've become very good at critical thinking as people. Yeah. I think we kind of blow it off and just listen to what CNN tells us and not think about it for ourselves. So it's, I don't know. I uh, that's kind of like just personal bias I have. I think. So let's talk about the vaccine again, the process. Like me, I was in the military. Like we would get like hundreds of vaccines all the time. You, you deploy Afghanistan, you get 20 mm-hmm. vaccines. So, so in the military, you kind of use like get a vaccine. Okay, someone who we're going to trust is smart tells us to put this in a body, right? So we kind of go with it, right? Yeah. But a lot of people don't do that, right? So how, how, how would you, if you had to do it over again, or if you were in the position of power, how would you convince these people hesitant to get the vaccine to convince them to get the vaccine? Well, I'd listen to science, but I'd also be really sensitive to, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of history here, right? There's a lot of mistrust, you know, legitimately. Um, It's a very complicated issue. So when you look at, um, we talked a little bit about Seattle vaccination rates being really high. Seattle's also the most, you know, usually tied with Minneapolis for the most literate city in the country. And we're also the most educated in terms of like degrees by population, right? So those are, you know, correlations, right? Between the vaccine. If you go to the flip side of that, if you go to um, rural areas where people are less educated, or maybe they are more on the conservative side of the political spectrum, or maybe they're of a uh, racial minority or an underrepresented population, much less likely to get vaccinated, right? So. Right now, I think we've hit around that. We're getting close to the 70% mark in a lot of states and, and, and trying to creep up to that as a country. That 30%, that remaining 30%, it, it may never get vaccinated, right? We're dealing with a certain population there that is um, hesitant, to your point, like we developed that vaccine so quickly. Does it work? Is it safe? Um, people read stories about um, past like horrible, like transgressions or, um, you know, do I trust the man out there, right? The government who really sort of um, put this vaccine out. I I have some colleagues in the Philadelphia area and a couple months ago when people were really starting to go out there and get vaccinated, they set up a huge vaccine test or vaccine administration area at um, at the downtown Philadelphia Convention Center so they could bring in hundreds of people, right? What did they do to protect this and make sure that it was safe for everybody? They had like the National Guard out front with rifles. So if you're a little hesitant about the government or suspicious of this- The optics are not good. The optics are not good. You're like, you walk up, I'm seeing guys with assault rifles in camo and I'm like, make a U-turn and you're right out of here. There's a lot of this related to my world, like in clinical research, same as the vaccines. you know, to do good science, you know, you study something in what you hope is like, you can't study it in the whole world, so you study it in a sample, and you want your sample to be representative of the world, right? If you run a clinical trial, and everybody who enrolls looks like you and I, white dudes who are middle-aged, that is not good science. We are not representing things, and there are a lot of drugs that don't work or work differently in some ethnic minorities who have different sort of metabolism or different enzymes or different biomarkers. Um, It's really good science to study these things in everyone, but even beyond good science, it's the right thing to do, right? And so um, there are a ton of challenges with being able to educate people about what a clinical trial is, um, to ensure there's a level of trust, um, you know, I don't know if you've been to the doctor lately, but um, people's outcomes, their healthcare outcomes are better when their doctor looks like them and talks like them, right? So if you're a African-American woman in their mid twenties and you live in Atlanta, Georgia, and you go to your white physician at Emory University, talk about a clinical trial, there might be a disconnect 
There might be a communication barrier. There may just be some blatant distrust. So we kind of need, we need to work on helping train um, community leaders and we need to work on training minority physicians who can connect with their communities. Cause I'm somebody who believes, you know, everybody should be getting the vaccine, but this stretches beyond just the vaccine. It's trust, it's healthcare, it's the man, it's the military with the rifles outside the vaccine center. There's a lot of people out like, there. Like, that, who thought that was a good idea? Like, I don't know. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, I was amazed. So, you know, you're trying to encourage people. Um, you know, we're also trying to, you know, I'm somebody who believes in to each their own, right? And I want, I respect people making their own decisions. And I realize everybody operates from a different history and perspective and things. Um, but we need to be doing a better job with healthcare, clinical trials, and vaccines in terms of like educating, giving people opportunities, um, and hopefully they'll make the right choice. So follow-up question, like a lot of people do get the vaccine, right? But a lot of those people, I don't know the percentages are saying, well, I got that, I got the shot one time. I'm not doing the boost. I'm not doing the second shot. This is the one that done for me, right? What would you tell these people? Like, would you tell them, no, that's kind of, you know, you need to keep on getting the shots. Is that like flu shots? Are we, are we telling, well, no, no, and actually the one back, what you're covered now, what, you, what is, what's your advice for them? Well, depending on which one you get. I mean, yeah. I mean, like Pfizer's, it's a, it's a, it's a two part shot, you know? I mean, it's almost like I get shot one. I don't feel sick. COVID numbers are going down. The CDC says I don't have to wear my mask. I'll skip the second shot. You're getting like, you know, if you went to, if you went to like get new cars, put on your tire, you wouldn't get cars just put on the left side. <laughs> Right? No, you got to do the whole package, people. So um, don't get comfortable with the numbers. Um, don't think you can just half ass it. Like, I would just say, you know, if you can trust the process and you can trust the people that are doing the right thing, yeah, follow through with the whole thing. It's important. Scott, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but talk about the points of data and analytics and AI to clinical research. And has this always been the case for clinical research relied on these things, or is this a, a new phenomenon? In clinical research. Yeah, it's a little bit. So, I mean, data and analytics were very data driven, right? I mean, I've talked about science and scientists a lot already. Um, talk about clinical trials. We're trying to, we're trying to um, generate data. We're trying to generate data on efficacy and um, safety. Um, but when you talk about bigger numbers and bigger clinical trials and vaccines, um, yeah, you, you need to evolve a little bit so that you're not just, you know, you're not just manually going from a spreadsheet, right? You need to be moving into leveraging smarter tools and, and not letting humans be kind of the rate limiting factor of analyzing something. So AI is, you know, I mean, we're just seeing the, the very beginnings of it, I think. I mean, it's, it's infiltrating a lot of my industry, but I think it's, you know, that's a fraction of where it's going to go. I think it's going to be everywhere in a good way, right? So we can learn from trends and um, help us spot, you know, um, maybe something only happens in one out of a million people, but AI can help us identify those specifics so that like, if someone else could potentially be that second out of a million, we would know that ahead of time. But, you know, the stuff that we see day to day in our consumer lives, like Amazon telling us what book we might like next, next or, um, you know, Expedia suggesting a hotel we want to stay in because they saw something we looked at. Using those tools to just be smarter about the data we have and make smarter um, decisions is great. You know, so if you were in the, in this world of vaccines and developing new medicines, um, if you go to like a healthcare system and you have, I don't know, 20,000 patients here at the UW Medical Center, um, you know, what if you ask somebody the question, well, do you have... Um, you have some patients with breast cancer there? Oh yeah, we've got a thousand actually. Okay, well, do you have you know do you have breast cancer patients that are in between forty and fifty? Oh yeah, we've got eight hundred of those. But do you have some who have like triple negative hormone markers and have failed two previous therapies? Oh, we can't really search for that or figure that out. But through some algorithms and AI, not only can you find those patients better. You can also start learning who responds to what, right? We're all a little different. And um, the details of, of kind of what's going on like at a molecular or cellular level, we can't, we can't really sort of know that at times. But when you take a lot of data, um, AI algorithms can help us be way more efficient and smart about so many things. 
So I don't know. Do you see AI in any of the other industries you yeah, touch base with? Yeah, AI is like the next big thing coming. You know, like I mean, AI is already here. When you think about it, right? Algorithms. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, AI is taking over the world. I, I would think. You know. Yeah. Um, Scott, what what's the definition? Of what makes something a rare disease? Sure. So rare. Um, it's not common. Um, rare is, uh, is, is defined by, um, the, the amount of patients who have a particular disease in like a given country. So the United States has a definition of, you know, this many patients, um, or this many out of a million have a specific disease, have a, have the disease in Europe and Japan do that as well. So essentially you have some diseases that don't occur very much. Right. And so. The interesting thing is when you look within the US, we've got, you know, 350 million or so people. We've got more than 30 million people with a rare disease. So all these little individual rare diseases, you know, there might be 10,000 people with that or 500 with that or just 12 with this. Taken together, they're like 10% of the population. So they make up, they're not very rare when they're taken together. Um, and those definitions kind of came to be because Going back to big pharma, um, you know, our commercial industry partners are looking to develop drugs that they can make a lot of money off of. And rare diseases are not going to be a blockbuster, right? It takes millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these drugs and get them out there. There's not that many prescriptions going to be written for the disease that has a thousand people, right? So um, we had to build some incentives in place to say, listen, there's not a lot of patients with this disease. We need someone to develop a new medicine. We want to help these patients. Will you please develop this medicine? We'll make it a little easier for you. We'll try to provide you with some tax benefits, with some, um, you know, some um, um, having word finding problems this morning, um, you know, lower developmental costs, um, maybe some extra market exclusivity and patents and things like that. So that it starts making sense from a business case, even if you want to do the right thing and develop a medicine for a rare disease, you know, you have to be smart. You have to be able to like cover your costs and maybe make a little money. So um, the orphan rare disease industry has been created to um, help bring medicines to patients who need them and try to do it in an effective way. Scott, does rare disease necessarily also mean deadly disease? No, it doesn't. Rare just means how often it occurs. So some people could live with a rare chronic condition and have it for their whole life, for sure. Um, about half of rare diseases um, occur in children and about half are genetic in nature. And there are certainly, so there's more than 7,000 individual rare diseases that have been identified. We're finding more all the time as we learn more about genome and our bodies and things. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of them um, are fatal, absolutely, and they're terrible. Um, um, but not all of them are, and they're not, it's not necessarily synonymous. It essentially means there's not a lot of them, and then you hear rare, and you also hear orphan, right? Mm -hmm. Orphan drug. Um, orphan because, you know, they're kind of like left behind, or sometimes we have a medicine sitting on a shelf that could treat a rare disease, but it doesn't make business sense sometimes to like pull that off the shelf invest all that money and you know there may not be a return on that scott so why do you become involved in clinical research like what got you on that career path well way back when when i was um undergraduate and going to graduate school i was always really analytical and kind of scientific and i i fell into some research and i really loved it and i was doing a lot and um at one point I was working with a couple of professors and I had to write a, uh, a federal grant application, I remember. And as part of it, you have to justify to the National Institutes of Health or whoever was gonna fund that research, you know, your justification. Why is this research so damn important? And I remember really struggling to like justify it. Like I was the one writing the grant and I couldn't really convince myself that it was super, super important this kind of research I was doing was pretty basic and I didn't see it having a lot of application. I didn't see the like the so what question. So I kind of pivoted a little bit. I realized I needed to work in an area that was more applied, that really could make a difference for people that could have an impact, not just studying some small, basic, maybe academic questions. So I kind of fell into this world of 
epidemiology, pharmacoepidemiology, and clinical trials. And um, um, that was a long time ago. And I've loved it because it's, I love the science. I love um, helping people. And I feel like we can always be doing a little better. Like there's a room for constant improvement in this space. So um, yeah, that's how I got there. So Scott, from your perspective, what's something positive about the American healthcare, healthcare system and something negative about the American healthcare system? Geez, well, that's a big question. Something positive and something negative. Um, well, I am a little bit of like a free market guy. And so I do like that we have if you have a good idea or you have some novel approach, um, I feel like there's an opportunity for you to build that better mousetrap and insert it into the healthcare system and see if you can make a difference and see if you can build something that works. So I like that. I like that fact that we, I like the fact that it's not nationalized and that, you know, really anyone can sort of start a company or a nonprofit or an institute of sorts and uh, contribute and be part of that ecosystem. I think that's great. That doesn't exist everywhere. What's wrong with it? Or what are some negatives? I mean, I don't know, how long do we have? No, just kidding. I think, um, I mean, we have all this money that goes towards healthcare in our country. We have, I think we spend way more per capita than any other country. Don't quote me on that, I think, but I think we're number one. Um, we have all this incredible technology, right? CT scans and MRI scans and really nice hospitals and decent healthcare. But we're not, over time, we spend more and more on healthcare and the outcomes of our people aren't getting better at all. They're not getting worse, actually. We're spending more and the actual end result is worse. So I believe there's the system thinkers out there. I think the healthcare system is designed to do exactly what it's doing. And I honestly think that like our healthcare system is kind of designed to create more jobs. And there are a lot of jobs and there are a lot of systems and there's a lot of levels of care and insurance and payers and reimbursement. And um, I think that that's a huge problem and I have no idea how to fix that. But um, when I look at it objectively, I feel like that, um, we're going in the wrong direction, I feel like. So Scott, for people who want to break into the medical field or clinical research, what advice do you have for them? Like people and students, the college, what advice do you have for them like get break into this career? Well, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, I think if you're someone who's scientific or analytically minded, um, you don't have to have a PhD or a, you don't have to be a physician to do that. There are tons of opportunities depending on what you're sort of drawn to. It could be, you could be a data scientist or you could be um, working on legal or financial components. Um, I think like anything that first, <clears throat> taking that first step into the industry is challenging. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who have like, maybe like a scientific, maybe like a lab background or maybe they're a chemist and they wanna kind of transition into clinical research and kind of move to the other side. And it's hard, it's hard to get that kind of initial experience or have someone give you a chance. I think if you're young, I think do some volunteering or find somewhere that you can do an internship or um, you know, some type of um, research practicum. Maybe if you're in college or in graduate school, try to, you know, get your feet wet a little bit, make sure you like it, see if you, if you enjoy it, but try to get a little bit of practical experience so then you can reach out and when you have to take that first job and have someone sort of take a leap of faith with you as an inexperienced person, hopefully you have a little bit of something you can, you can bring and show that's practical. So um, it's, it's hard to make that, get, kind of get that first step of experience. But once you do, there are, you know, my company has thousands, literally thousands of job opportunities right now open around the world. And we're not alone. There are not enough people as we come out of the pandemic to do this. So if you want a career in clinical research, there are great jobs available. Um, I think they pay well. I think it's a really good industry. And um, if you're like me and you wanna be doing something positive and contributing to people's health, 
the end of the day, I think it's great, great place to be. Yeah, I think there's a challenge for like people in all industries, right? Trying to get their first internship, their first break, right? Because companies like new experience, students like, well, I don't have one, give it to me, right? So that's, you know. Yeah. But I think once you get in, you're in and you have to prove yourself, you're golden. Yeah, I think so. Maybe you need to be a little creative or a little scrappy or maybe even, you know, don't set yourself, don't set your goals super high at the beginning. Be willing to take some basic low level position maybe just to get in in a company and have some experience even if it's not your dream situation you know get a year of experience under your belt and i think from there you can really pivot and do a lot so scott how would you how would you improve the drug development process well covid's been really the, the silver lining for my industry uh, amidst all the terrible stuff that's been out there and the spotlight it's really shown on um, health inequities, especially um, the spotlight and the silver lining has shown us that we can do things faster, right? We can develop these vaccines faster. Um, it's also, it also, um, there's some, there's some ways we've run clinical trials that we've done the same thing for decades, literally have not evolved as Amazon gets created and, and blows up and takes over the world and modifies how everyone interacts with like, shopping and apps, my industry has, become, has been a dinosaur doing the same thing for decades. COVID though, forced us to um, stop. And when you couldn't go to a hospital or a patient wasn't gonna go to a hospital, how do you keep these clinical trials moving? How do you keep developing new medicines? So we were forced to adopt some new strategies and new approaches and, and new really research paradigms that a lot of us have been talking about for years, but our, our pharma clients are very risk averse. They're very like, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> give us a call back when you've done that 20 times, or that sounds risky. You know, that whole phrase, you don't get, you don't, what is it? You don't get fired if you hire IBM or something like that. Very risk averse industry. Says they're innovative, wants to be open to it, but doesn't want to be the first ones. And so COVID though forced us to say, okay, um, that, that innovation you've been talking about, Scott, um, we weren't ready, but now we need it. Now we need it for everything. And so everyone really had to kind of jump on board um, because like necessity was literally the mother of invention in this case, right? So because people had to, um, we started adopting these new techniques and approaches and paradigms, decentralized clinical trials is kind of our hot term for that right now. Um, and that has really, really, the industry has evolved in like 15 months, probably more than the previous 15 years. So that's very exciting for me. So that's a great step. Um, we need to like not lose that and revert back to old ways just because we're coming out of the pandemic. I think we need to like build on that and keep going forward. And I think we need to like learn from other industries. Um, so the fact that, you know, we, you know, back to the phone, you know, we, you know, I shop online, right? I bank online. Um, I'm married, but a lot of people date online. We do everything online. Um, trade stock online, whatever it is, request a car, book a hotel. But this clinical research space is still pretty analog. And we made some good steps, but I think we need to learn from other industries and make clinical trials fit into patients' lives the same way an Uber app fits in and makes it really easy to do things. Scott, do you happen to know like how many drugs are in development on any given day? How many? Yeah. Are in the, oh, I don't. Thousands. Thousands. Yeah, Thousands. Like, that's, that's a lot. I'm guessing it's a I lot. I think there's, I don't have stats in front of me. I think we need something like, I think for 2021 in the world, of all the clinical trials, we need something like 40 million patients to participate in the clinical trials that are open right now or will be open this year. That's, I don't know what, that, that's a significant number of patients, right? And so half of these trials are behind schedule because you have something like less than 5% of patients who are eligible participate. So if we go back to that breast cancer hypothetical study, um, we go to the University of Washington, we have a thousand patients, we have 800 who have this marker. Um, most patients never hear about the trial. 
most patients' physicians are too busy to even take a moment to talk to them about it. Um, there's some bureaucratic stuff involved and ad and administrative like paperwork and holdups that make it challenging to do. And so you end up with these patients who don't participate for a variety of reasons. So it's, it becomes like a backlog. Scott, let's suppose there's like hundred drugs in development. How many of those will actually be approved? Well, the old numbers were something like one out of a hundred. Okay. That made so very, it very hard. Ended into development even. So, and that's, and I would argue that that's actually like midway down the funnel. So like you could start with a thousand drugs in a lab and 800 of them make it out of some laboratory uh, in vitro testing and 500 make it into animals. And of those um, 100 make it into humans. And of those 100, only one. So it really is probably something like one out of 1,000 make it from an idea and a test tube to approval, right? Now with drug development, like the approval process, like hopefully it's mainly science, right? Have to imagine somebody has to do a lobbying, right? How much is it? How much does place for lobbying? Like, like, because I'm guessing big pharma has an advantage, has like the lobbyists, all that kind of stuff. Does yeah. that really play a role? Is all is all strictly science across the board? That's a good question. Well, I mean, yeah, big pharma definitely has their lobbyists, right? They're very focused on, um, you know, they're thinking about the revenue of the drugs they're developing, right? And so if there's like a new prescription drug user act, or if there's some new type of um, Obamacare um, pricing strategy that's going to impact what they can get paid for the drugs that they've spent hundreds of millions developing. Yeah, they're going to be very focused on that. The, as far as like lobbying for um, the clinical trial development space, um, I think there's some smaller efforts around just Let's try to harmonize things. Let's try to um, remove some of the bureaucracy. Um, let's try to make things, let's try to, you know, make our FDA be more like um, easier to work with, things like that. But I, I don't know, naively, I feel like most of the pharma lobbying is more around like, you know, prescription drug costs and access and reimbursement insurance and things like that. Okay. Scott, next, I want you to talk about your, your volunteer work with, with an organization called Uplifting Athletes. Can you talk about that some? Sure, yeah, it's a great organization. Uplifting Athletes is um, started in Pennsylvania um, and um, was started to um, try to bring a uh, awareness. It was really to tr create awareness around rare diseases. So, um, you know, we have celebrities on and we have influencers and people out there with these platforms, right? So, um, you know, if it's, I don't know who you're, are you a basketball fan or a football, a football fan? fan? Okay. So let's say, you know, we're in Seattle. So let's say um, Russell Wilson wants to join us today, right? So Russell Wilson has an enormous platform and followers everywhere. He can leverage his platform to create an, a lot of awareness around things that have nothing to do with football, right? As we know. Maybe it's shoes or maybe it's his new nonprofit he's running, which is really focused on a great thing. What we're doing with uplifting athletes is we're leveraging that the, the power and the platform that athletes have to um, create more awareness and voices for rare diseases and rare disease patients. And so we do that through a few things. We, um, you know, there's in the football space, we do this, um, my cleats, my cause. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see that yeah. out in both college and NFL football where um, people will create cleats with artists to um, represent and advertise like a, a, a nonprofit foundation that they want to support. And then those will get auctioned off to raise money, but creating some awareness of that. Um, you know, it's, it's similar. This is an individual who runs this organization for us called Rob Long, who's an amazing guy. Rob was a punter in college and he was about to be drafted as like the number one punter in the NFL, um, go Syracuse. And he was diagnosed with a brain tumor um, right during his senior year, a little bit before the NFL draft and basically brought everything to a halt. He's now several years out and doing really well, but um, you know, he got started leading this organization because he felt like 
He was like, you know, football players go out and um, whether you're college or NFL, right? You have people who handle your equipment for you and people tell you what time to be there. And your coach tells you what to, so you can just think, all you need to think about is playing football. You don't have to raise money. You don't have to do a bake sale to get a new Jersey. You, um, someone else is going to make sure you get from point A to point B. Someone else is going to handle the crowd and the food and whatever. These clinical researchers and scientists working in rare diseases, they spend a fraction of their time actually working on rare diseases. They're writing grants to get new money. They're trying to do talks on their research to gain more attention so they can help get their research funded. Um, what if rare disease physicians and rare disease investigators had the support that like Russell Wilson has around him? What if they had a coach and an entourage and a support staff so that Russell could focus on being the best football player um, and not be distracted by these things. Our investigators out there can be um, way more effective if we could support them with some tools. And so uplifting athletes is all around leveraging the platform of sports and the platform of athletes to create awareness for rare. And how long have you been involved with them? A couple of years, like about three years now. Um, we have an annual, um, of course, COVID is, of course, it's interrupted everything. It's also interrupted our, uh, as a football fan, you know, uh, the NFL draft is a pretty fun event in whatever April time frame. We do our own young investigator grant where we um, review grant applications and we fund research. So investigators apply uh, to do some cutting edge, um, groundbreaking research in rare diseases. And we select, um, I think we selected eight uh, researchers this year. And we hold a, an investigator draft, which is a little bit analogous to the NFL draft, where we draft investigators and hand out money to support their amazing research. So we're trying to um, fund more research and create more awareness. So Scott, you also on the on two startup advisory boards. One, hope I say this name right. One for a company called Jiva Informatics Solutions and Halo Health Systems. Can you talk about why you joined them as, as, as advisors and what those two companies do? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I do have, I'm wearing a couple hats these days. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm entrepreneurial in nature. And so I work for a large global company and I'm very focused on rare disease drug development. Um, at the same time, like I mentioned, our industry has been quite archaic and I think that we can evolve a lot. Both of these organizations, Jiva and Halo Health, um, have created some new technology to, um, help clinical trials be delivered directly to patients, allow patients to participate from their homes. Um, and so in my role, I serve as an advisor for, um, you know, in both these cases, a CEO that has started an organization and needs some support and guidance from someone who knows our industry well. Um, I try to make some introductions and support them in their efforts. I try to guide them on um, developing their product. And um, it allows me to, um, you know, it's like a vitamin or a supplement. It's something that I do on the side from my main work day to day at PRA Health Sciences, now ICON, um, to, um, yeah, fulfill my entrepreneurial needs and to try to also, I really try to give back a little bit and support, right? So I've been in my industry for a while and I want to help others, um, you know, make some progress there too. So it's got like most people, you have a lot going on, you know, really busy, you know, different things. How do you stay focused on what's important, right? Like how on day to day, do you do things like priority one through five versus going like priority 99 to 100, right? Yeah. So how do I just personally prioritize? Yeah. yeah I try to, I try to say no to a lot of things. Um, I try to say no to a lot of things that are, you know, maybe a little bit off target or not critical right now. We talked earlier about, um, I forget the phrase, but in the army, you know, you can't focus in the future when you're in a, is it a six, six, inch, six inch knife six fight. Inch knife fight. So I feel like for me, for a company, for, for the army as well, if you focus just on your six inch knife fight, you know, and you don't, you don't also have somebody looking ahead a little bit and you got your head down all the time, you're going to wake up and you're going to be behind or fighting the wrong war or on the wrong line of defense. I feel like you've got to balance a little bit of like, the here and now, but also have an eye on the future. And 
you know, that balance could evolve a little bit from day to day. Sometimes I might be thinking a little bit more long-term strategically. Other days I might be like, I have a ton on my plate I need to do right now. So I try to, um, I try to prioritize that way, balancing. Um, but I also really value, I try to talk to somebody different. I try to talk to somebody every day that I've never met before. So I always try to have some kind of conversation with a, a patient or a new organization, or maybe it's a colleague or whoever, having some kind of introductory conversation and um, seeing if I can help them, seeing if I learn something new. Um, what else do I do? I have a great team of people at work that I support. And um, I also try to give them as many opportunities as possible. So if something comes across my plate, um, it's not so much, am I busy or not, but like, does it make sense for me to do that? Or would somebody else benefit from getting a chance to, you know, come to your next podcast or something like that? So Scott, back to the, to those two startups or vice, what about those two startups or the founder teams like influence you to, to get on the board and have them run? What, what cut your eye about those startups that said, you know, this is worth my time mm -hmm. and my effort like to help these people out? Yeah. Great question. Um, well, they're both, and I don't mean to lump them together. They're two obviously distinct organizations, distinct startup founders, really both fascinating guys. Um, I guess I think like a lot of things, it's the people. I think I believe in both of these individuals. Um, Harsha, who started Jiva, I've known him for quite a while. Um, I think he's passionate and trying to do the right thing. And I think he has a good vision. And I also think there was a timing aspect of this with um, what he was trying to build um, coming along at a time during the pandemic when we kind of had to shift this, like I was talking, shifting this paradigm of like clinical trials being conducted in a more modern way. Um, so I, I believed in him and I believed in the timing of it. Um, similarly for um, my friend Veer at Halo, um, I really believe in him and his product and offering. And I felt like maybe even more so with Halo, I felt like I could also contribute, right? So it's not just, oh, I wanna join you as an advisor. Like, can I actually contribute and help you with something tangible? And it's okay if I can't. Um, I don't want to waste his time or anyone's, but um, I felt like I could really help him at the stage he was at. So I felt like that was a good, in both those cases, was and still is a great use of my time. And I'm also a firm believer that, you know, not just, you know, it's hard to have just like one thing fully like gratify you, right? Like I need variety. I need a couple different things. Um, I like to be on, um, I like to support nonprofits where I can, if I'm really aligned with their mission. Um, if I can be helpful for a startup organization um, and offer something great, great. I'm, I'm all in, sign me up. Got to balance that with not over committing, of course. <laughs> um, but I, pers I mean, there are a ton of great causes and um, a lot of my stuff's focused on clinical research, patients, rare diseases, and, um, there's countless other organizations out there that um, could use a hand and can use some resources. So I'm probably going to sign up for another one soon. So Scott, follow question. What, make, what makes you say no to a startup that comes to you? Cause I have to mention you had a lot of people come to you to be a advisor. Like what makes you say no, just timing, the fit's not right. It's not in the industry. Maybe I'm having a bad day. Um, it depends. I mean, I mean, I think that, you know, some things might sound really appealing, but um I don't really have a lot of ego. I mean, if I feel like if I'm not the right guy, like, you know, thank you. I'm flattered you asked, but this probably isn't a good fit for me. I bet you could do better if you talk to my, you know, if you talk to John Smith, you should talk to him because he really might be able to help you more than I can. So some of it's fit, some of it's timing, right? I mean, like I'm somebody who I try to find balance in my life, but I also don't strive for like, every day being perfectly balanced, right? Like today I mentioned, I got up at 4 a.m. I had a five o'clock presentation. Um, not really so balanced right now. Um, a little bit of a wreck actually, but um, I try to balance out maybe over the course of a week or a month. I try to make sure I've got a lot of balance. So we're coming off of a three day weekend. That was great uh, to sort of get disconnected and hang out with my family. Um, I might, the, the pendulum might swing the other way for a couple of days. 
But I hope that over a week or a month, I really try to like get some balance there. Is Seattle known as like a mid tech hub? Like like New York City is known as a fintech hub. The Silicon Valley is like Seattle knows a mid tech hub. Is that is that like another city? This might be unpopular, but I don't think so. When I I moved to Seattle 20 years ago, and there was a fair number of um, biotech companies. That's why I moved here. I was I was recruited from a local biotech company that is no longer. Um, over that time, you know, I don't know how long you've been in Seattle, but you know, we've had ridiculous growth, right? Our city's blown up and we're known for a couple things. Um, sure, there is a little bit of biotech, there is the Hutch and UW, and there's a few companies in the area. Um, a lot of those companies have picked up and moved to Boston, for example, um, because some cities like Boston, San Diego, um, the Bay Area, there's a few pockets that have like doubled down on med tech and biotech and things like that. And they, those are the kind of companies we want. There's a lot of economic incentives offered. Um, they're trying to attract and retain those companies. And Seattle, unfortunately, selfishly has not done that. We've, we've placed bets on stuff like software and e-commerce and um, maybe a little bit of gaming. And it's hard to argue with that, right? I mean, you look around, I mean, Microsoft, Amazon, Zillow, Expedia, um, it goes Tableau, it goes on and on and on. I think we've focused in that area. And Seattle's probably dropped from like a second or third tier down a little bit. There is a little bit of, we have a really strong entrepreneurial spirit here. We have some good, um, investing groups. And there are, you know, there are like a dozen startups out there that are doing cool things. So I'm hoping that that'll be like the next generation. But um, I travel around a lot and Seattle's, you know, it's it's down a couple tiers right now from some other cities. All right, Scott. So I might have read this wrong, but I think you're, and this is in the future, but I think you're in some kind of panel in 2022 in Philadelphia. Next year? Next year, yeah. I think I Probably. saw this somewhere. Um. I don't know yet about 2022. Okay, yeah. Probably. I I've think I saw a lot of somewhere. talks coming up. There's a good chance. Um, well, like you do a, a lot of talks, right? I do. So that far out, I don't know. There's like a World Orphan Drug Congress, I think in April. I think that's it, yeah. That I know it's in it. Philadelphia in April 2022. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what it is. So um, not that I don't take those seriously, but- um, I mean, that is a long way I out. I got a couple in July and a couple in August and trying to keep my eye on the ball that way, but yeah. So why do you do these? Is, 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 does your job make you do it? You do it because you like doing it and you like putting yourself out there and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Good question. Um, my job doesn't make me do it. I think that in my role, I think that um, what I would call like thought leadership is important. Um, and so whether it's talking about new paradigms or um, sharing case studies or experiences of things we've done, or maybe even talking a little bit ambitiously about what could be, um, again, I'm, I feel like our industry is archaic and it has evolved quite a bit during COVID. There's so much better that we can do. And I, you know, I know people, dying from diseases right and left. I know people cannot wait for new treatments. So it really drives me to show up with my A game and it drives me to be committed to improving the way we work. And one of the ways is not just to keep my head down and work, but to actually get out there on my proverbial soapbox and talk a little bit about like, we should be doing this. We could be moving the needle a lot further in some directions or, you know, don't limit yourself. Think Let's borrow ideas from other industries. So I do a lot of that because um, I think it's important. Um, and then when you get really old like me, you know, people just ask you to do these things too. So that's part of it. So Scott, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who like, you know, like they focus on a product, build a product, but they don't get out there and like speak, you know, whether how they need, need to, right? They put themselves out there for a reason. What advice you have to them? Like, hey, no, you know, startup found, you need to get out there and talk about your product, talk about yourself so people know who you are. Yeah, well, I think there's there's a couple threads there. I think there's there's in this in this age we're in, there's probably some personal branding that would benefit people to be doing for themselves. Um, for me, um, and I was talking to my kids about it this weekend. Um, I am really weird. I really like getting out of my comfort zone as much as possible, honestly. 
So even coming in here today, I was like, I don't know how the hell we're going to do this. What are you going to ask me? I don't, are we on video? I don't even know what the agenda is. Um, I'm okay with that because I feel like every time you put yourself in an unfamiliar, uncomfortable situation, um, I feel like you grow and I feel like you learn and I feel like it forces you to adapt. And um, I've just got a, I've got a innate uh, tragic fear of complacency. So I am always trying to think about a little new, a little bit different and make sure that I'm not uh, getting lazy. Scott, so we talked about hiring earlier about new, new students. And I don't know if you do hiring yourself, but if you do do hiring, what do you look for in people when you bring them on? Like what kind of various characteristics, what do you look for? Yeah, I do a little bit of hiring. I'm trying to hire somebody right now and we're running into some roadblocks, but um, um, yeah, that's a great question. So what do I look for? Well, I'm really big on creating like, well, first off, I have a team that we've built. And so as our leader, I view myself as, you know, I view myself as supporting my team. I don't view myself as like out there leading and they follow. So my team is really, I try to empower them to like drive our decision making. And so when we interview or think about what we need or who we need, um, I'm certainly, I don't like to just, you know, dictate what that's going to be, right? I actually usually would abstain from voting and let my team make the call on that. And, and um, I'll certainly chime in if we need a little more direction, but it's important for me that my colleagues who are gonna have to work with a new team member really get along and like that person. Um, I think it's horrible when like a leader is like, this is what we're doing, deal with it. Um, that's just not my style, but in terms of the candidates, I mean, you know, there's characteristics, there's things that, you know, you can't really teach. There's There's people that will come maybe with a certain skill set or experience that's perfect, but I guess I'm looking for like positive attitude. I'm looking for people that can be collaborative and are really open to like partnering and working together. Um, I'm interested in people who have ideas about things they want to do that are new. Um, I like people that can be creative and think a little bit outside the box. Um, I also intentionally create an environment at work where um, their things are left a little loose intentionally to be able to allow people to um, maximize their strengths and experience and, and grow in certain directions. So not everyone's like a tailor fit model of each other, right? If I've got 10 people on my team, they may all have some slightly different strengths and weaknesses and, and be able to focus on different things. So. I try to create an environment that that works that, where that works for people and not everybody is interested in that, right? Some people need, you got to tell me A, B, and C what I'm doing and the time that I do it. And um, that's hard for me. I, I don't really think that way. So yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, I, I can't do that either. You know, so your company's headquarters in North Carolina here in Seattle. So the people that work for you, are you all over the States? Are they all here in Seattle? Nobody's here in Seattle. We don't even have an office in Seattle or in Washington state. I do have some colleagues in the greater Seattle area. Um, my specific team is spread throughout us and Canada. So uh, nobody's in Seattle. We're all over. I've got people in Toronto, Birmingham, Alabama, Cincinnati, Ohio, Phoenix, Arizona, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, Michigan, Virginia, all over. So y'all doing covered, y'all were doing a remote work before COVID hit then? We were. So my, my company, we have lots of offices around the country and the world, but um, only one of us lives near an office. And so, yeah, we've been very, I guess my company's a little bit forward thinking that way in terms of working remotely. And then we, we do travel, you know, pre COVID traveling a fair amount to conferences, um, like you talked about. Um, also, we do a lot with like client meetings and um, getting together with colleagues and meetings in our offices. So it's a remote work plus travel is typically in a normal world what we'd be doing. Scott, so I'm going to read a quote from me. I think I found this on LinkedIn. There will always be hurdles, roadblocks, and speed bumps, especially if you're a partner, if you're a partner breaking new ground. I don't know if you remember that you saying that quote or not. Can you talk, can you talk about that? 
Yeah, um, that's vaguely familiar. I feel like when you, and there are, right? Things are challenging. Things are, you know, unpredictable and you're going to run into things. And I think when you run into hurdles or roadblocks or obstacles or potholes or whatever your favorite analogy is, um, to me, that doesn't mean that you, you know, it doesn't mean that you, you give up and you, you change your plans. It just means you got to figure out a way to work around those things. You got to go over them or around them or under them, or maybe tweak your approach a little bit, but you don't just give up because it got a little hard. Um, so I just feel that um, if you're really determined, you know, I mean, um, I think that there's often a way and I think you should exhaust all options before you really give up. So um, I don't know, to me, I, I find that those hurdles are inherent in most things. Um, not everything's super hard, but like, I guess I approach it with the mindset of, I'm gonna run into some challenges here. I don't know what they're gonna be, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay focused. And you know, if you're good at like delayed gratification or something <laughs> like that, right? You're like, you're playing the long game and you're like, okay, it's gonna be a battle to get there, but um, I'm keeping my eye down the road and um, maybe I need to focus on my, six inch knife fight. That's my new, my new phrase I'm going with six inch knife fight right now. But I, I know I'm not, I'm not losing track of where I'm going. And I think that that just, I don't know if that's the right way to be thinking, but that's kind of just what works for me. So Scott, looking at your crystal ball, do you see an industry like, you know, staying archaic, you know, bureaucratic, like always like last 20 years, or do you think they're going to actually like, you know, go to the AI route, tech route, and, you know, and, and take this COVID development thing lead and run with that and, like, and actually develop into the, you know, the, a new organization, so to speak. Yeah, I think I'm really, I'm a very positive person and I am very optimistic about our industry. I think that the, there's, a, there's a COVID component that we've learned that we can do better, faster, and we can be innovative. There's also a lot of money and investment out there right now that people are looking to do things to. And I think companies have seen that this space, this clinical research space, this paradigm of being a little archaic is ripe for innovation, right? And for a while we've had like the Googles and the Apples of the world kind of looking at us and maybe dabbling a little bit, but sort of looking at us from the outside saying, you know, those guys are a mess. They're really inefficient. This can be way better. And nobody's really kind of completely jumped in, but um, I think between the investments and showing that what we can do and then I think we're starting to just see a lot more technology and AI getting incorporated into most of the conversations we have. So I'm really encouraged. Um, I think we will learn from other industries. You know, I don't know if it's analogous to like becoming the Uber as opposed to the yellow cab or if it's <laughs> becoming the Tesla as opposed to the, you know, the old Fords. But I do feel like, um, you know, we've got the FDA out there that is encouraging innovation and becoming easier to work with. We have money, we have ideas, we have technology. I think we have the right ingredients. And I think there still will be some of the, um, there will be some of our risk averse pharma folks out there that just kind of do it the way they've always done it. And, um, you know, innovate or die or evolve or die, whatever that looks like. I think we're going to transform and I'm pretty excited to be part of it. So Scott, this might be also a subject, but like doctors, they go to school forever. They have this high debt, you know, how does that impact the drug development process? Like, do like, do they, I don't know, probably does like, no, you're a doctor, $200,000 in debt and this, and, and like, and you do clinical trials. Does that, does that play any, pro, any part in the process or I'm off base? A totally separate, like, separate area. I don't know. I don't know if that really, I think what plays a role is, physicians, you know, go to medical school and do a residency and maybe a fellowship. And, you know, seven, eight years later, they come out with debt and they go to work. And let's say if you're like a clinician, let's say you're a general practitioner or using my oncologist example, you know, I, I, I know a fair amount of clinicians who um, are working in these hospital or healthcare systems that um, are really just they're just taking a beating from like the administrative junk. They're taking a beating from dealing, fighting with insurance companies to get drugs reimbursed for their patients. Um, COVID of course has hit a lot of our hospital systems really hard. 
a lot of our hospital systems in this area have lost a lot of money. They can't go out and hire people. So the people that are there are like overworked and stretched and there's no resources. In that world, I think you have people saying, you know what, I love my patients, but I can't take this anymore. I'm going to stop and I'm going to switch over here and go to work in an industry role for a biotech company. I think you see that a little bit, but I don't know if we see, I don't have any, you know, optics on like, does physician student debt impact the career choice or anything like that? Um, we want more physicians. We want more minority physicians. We want um, physicians to represent our population. I think we, I'd like to see us maybe not lower our standards for medical school or physicians, but we need to remove some barriers so we can get some more people out there. So Scott, at this point in my talk, I used to have a startup founder. I used to ask like, how do you come to get started? Where it comes now was a vision. So you want to ask you, what's the vision for yourself moving forward? Like what's, what do you see for your future self? Like if career wise, professional wise, what do you see yourself doing in the future? Well, I work for a big global company and I also support a couple small startups as an advisor. Um, I guess I'd like to be some, I'd like to be somewhere. Um, doesn't mean it needs to be a different work setting. I'd like to be in a role where um, I can leverage innovation and I can drive some innovation to really um, help new treatments get to patients fast. I'd like to be partnering with patients. I'd like to be making sure we learn from them and we think about them as the ultimate consumers. Um, I'd like to help steer, you know, an organization in innovative directions um, and keep surrounding myself with super smart people that are fun to work with. So um, I've been really happy doing what I'm doing. Like I said, I'm, I, uh, I don't like to be complacent. So I'm always sort of thinking about how to grow or challenge myself, but it'll be, I don't know if I don't have a specific setting in mind, but it'll be something like that, like technology, patients, new medicines, make it work better. Scott, is there anything that I should I ask you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover yet? Hmm. Well, we covered a lot of different things around me, my industry, COVID, vaccines, knife bites, future versus now. Um, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can you tell me about, so you clearly uh, interact with a lot of different people and doing these conversations. Um, why do you enjoy doing that? Uh, I, I mean, it's just fun. Like, 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 so I'm, I'm intro, right? People think I'm an expert because I do the podcast, but no, I'm different because I can control it. Right. I get to pick, I get to invite who I want to come in if who I think is interesting. Right. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I haven't, I've never had a bad interview so far. Right. I mean, it's a lot nice. of meet, meet, like you said, I, I do the same thing. Yeah, I try to meet one new person each day, right? To talk talk about something different, right? To expand her horizons and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And just you just learn and then you push it out to the public and see what they like or don't like. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Get exposed to a lot of things. Yes. Probably meet some interesting people. Yes. Um, touch on a lot of different industries as well. Yep. And then people ask me how you come to question, like, well, I just ask what I want to be what I, what I want to ask, right? And you that's what everybody wants to know, know, right? Like like I told you earlier with the interviews I do on here, like I, I take questions from the bio, the LinkedIn profile, do a quick Google search, you know, and that's in the next conversation comes up. And I just ask questions like pop up my mind, you know, like when I ask a question like CDC to FDA, this popped up my mind. Like how's that play in there? Right. So. Yeah. Well, and I also, I really don't like overstepping in my area of expertise. So like I'm not an infectious disease expert. I'm, you know, I don't work at the FDA. I'm, I'm not a medical student with debt trying to share my perspective on some of these things I might not be the authority on, but um, I liked your questions. It seemed to flow naturally. This is kind of a little new for me. So hopefully this went okay. It went great. It went great. So Scott, can you share social media, social media links for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, I'm a little old school. I'm not on um, Facebook or Twitter. Um, I do use LinkedIn a lot. Um, my name's Scott Schliebner, S-C-H-L-I-E-B-N-E-R is really the best place to find me, I think, there. Um, I don't have anything I'm live streaming or tweeting at the moment, but um, I am active and I do put out a lot of stuff there around like thought leadership and articles and toolkits and connections. So would love to uh, hear from people on LinkedIn. Yes, thanks, Scott.
Yeah. And to our listener, we'll have the links to Scott's social media on, show, on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshallblog.com. And don't forget to come to our in-person uh, Bunker Labs event on July 8th at 6 p.m. We have like 10 great military veterans pitching the business for two minutes and a panel on entrepreneurship in Seattle. And also my company, Kevin and HR, we're releasing our MVP and we're looking for people to join our wait list. And you can join our wait list at www.cabinetshr.co. So Scott, this is a great talk, but we're coming to the end of it. Can you give us advice on wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Uh, in wrapping and closure, no pressure. Um, yeah, well, I, I talked a little bit about comfort zone. I talked a little bit about like um, always trying to like push ourselves in areas that maybe we're uncomfortable with or areas maybe that we're not confident about or maybe that we don't feel like we know what we're doing. And I guess I feel like maybe you can't do that every minute or every hour of every day. But I think, you know, I think we should all challenge ourselves to like do something a little different today. Maybe you start small if it sounds scary. Um, pick up the phone and talk to somebody new. Um, try to do something you've never done. Cook something you've never made. And I think with each of those experiences, I feel like when you tackle a little bit of the unknown and if you have a little bit of success, you can build on that. And the next time you want to do something out of your comfort zone, it's a little easier. So, Scott, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. Pleasure to be here. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.